Advancements in imaging continue to transform the way medical professionals practice and treat their patients. And for the 15,000 members of the Society for Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, the annual meeting is the premier event to gain unparalleled access to the latest scientific advancements and research developments. This year's meeting will be held virtually, and we're here to show you the highlights on SNMMI-TV. Hello and welcome to SNMMI TV, a show created for the community of physicians, technologists, pharmacists, laboratory professionals, and scientists, all working to transform medicine and improve lives. On day four of our program, I'll be joined by Dr. Heiko Schoeder of Memorial Sloan Kettering regarding recent advancements in oncology. But first, let's look at today's top events of the meeting. On the final day of SNMMI 2021, you can start your day right with Transformation Tuesday. Choose from a variety of virtual activities in the relaxation zone, including chair stretches, meditation, tours of Washington DC landmarks, and the Hot Trot 5K virtual run. Today is another day packed with educational sessions and opportunities to visit the exhibit hall and the science pavilion. And the capstone of the meeting is the Henry N. Wagner Jr. MD Highlights Symposium, where four leading experts will give a comprehensive overview of the entire meeting with presentations on the cardiovascular highlights, the neurosciences highlights, the general nuclear medicine highlights, and the oncology and therapy highlights. This session also includes the announcement of two of the most important awards in imaging, the Henry N. Wagner Jr. MD Image of the Year and Best Paper of the Year. There's plenty to cover here on our final day of this virtual meeting. Let's start by taking a closer look at the Sierra Trial. The Sierra Trial hopes to change the world of bone marrow transplants by using targeted radiotherapy for BMT conditioning. The Sierra Trial is a study of a novel agent that incorporates targeted radiation as part of the conditioning regimen for a stem cell or bone marrow transplant, the IOMAP treatment, and is being used to treat patients who are older with refractory leukemia, for which transplant ordinarily is not an option. Pound for pound, a easier treatment to deliver than our regular strong transplant therapies. The rates of sepsis and mucositis seem to be lower. It's worked very well to get patients into remission. So it's very exciting treatment. It is definitely groundbreaking because this is one of the few treatments where we have been able to integrate dosimetry by doing patient-specific calculations and giving these radiation doses within the prescribed limits. I think it has the potential to, for application in other areas. It can be used for therapies such as the cellular therapies and gene therapies. If it proves to be a superior therapy to conventional care, the transplant community will start using the agent more frequently. Let's return to the events of this week's meeting now. Dr. Heiko Schoeder is with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and is giving the highlights lecture for oncology and therapy. Dr. Schoeder, thanks for joining me. Can you give us a bit of a preview of the lecture? Yes, in my lecture, I have tried to identify, it, to identify three major themes, uh, progress in clinical diagnostics and therapies, and that refers to items that are immediately relevant and uh, applicable today. Uh, second one is new targets that are currently being developed in the laboratory and may become clinically relevant in the not too distant future. And the third focal point was artificial intelligence and new equipment that moves our field forward. What types of cancer have been most significantly impacted by nuclear medicine? That's a difficult question to answer. I would say in the most recent past, Certainly, we have seen large progress in the management of neuroendocrine tumors, uh, both in terms of diagnosing with dotatate and also in terms of treating with lutetium dotatate. But I think at the moment, right now, as we speak, we see a lot of progress in the area of prostate cancer with the uh, approval of PSMA imaging agents, either labeled with gallium 68 or with F18, and also with the soon to 
the expected, I suppose, uh, approval of lotetium PSMA for treatment of uh, advanced prostate cancer. In your vision, what do you see as the most significant trends and developments for both practitioners and patients in the coming years? So one thing I expect, uh, as I pointed out, is the approval of the uh, PSMA agents for diagnostics and therapy. And I expect there will a large, there'll be a large number of patients that could potentially benefit from uh, treatment with PSMA. And I think it's really important for us as nuclear medicine community to be prepared, mentally ready, physically ready, logistically ready to take on these patients and to take ownership of this new and emerging field of diagnostics and broadening as therapeutic applications. What I also expect or hope for at least is an increasing number of new radio tracers or diagnostic molecules that can be applied in more than one cancer. So across a variety of cancers, both for diagnosing the disease and also for treating it in a specific manner. One part of the mission of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging is to transform medicine, but another is to improve lives. So we're here to hear more about the Women Heart Group. Thank you for being here. What is Women Heart? It was started in 1999 by three women who were really frustrated with their experience of being misdiagnosed or having their diagnosis delayed for quite some time because they just weren't believed in the healthcare system. The mission of the organization is to ensure that women have the education, support, and advocacy that they need to live heart-healthy lives. Women who have survived a heart attack or uh, been given a, a heart uh, disease diagnosis are trained at the uh, World Class Mayo Clinic uh, to become what we call women heart champions. And that means that they run support groups across the country, and they also uh, share their heart stories uh, with legislators who are putting together policies to improve uh, access to health to healthcare uh, for women with heart disease. So tell us, how can people join the conversation? It's a great, great question. The, the conversation around women's heart uh, luckily has been in some ways boosted by uh, our collective experience around the pandemic. Um, we are, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on uh, Twitter and um, in LinkedIn. We have also started something that we're calling the Heart Talks webinar series, where each webinar uh, is, each Heart Talk is bringing together a clinician, one or two uh, patient voices, and myself kind of moderating those conversations. In addition to that, if women are interested in becoming a champion themselves, um, actually the application process is now open and uh, we are recruiting uh, incoming champions to be part of the class of 2020. Finally, we've saved the best for last. Each year, SNMMI showcases its image of the year, and winning the award is quite an honor. Joining us from Germany is this year's winner, Ghana Blaschenes. Congratulations on winning the image of the year award. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to the Society for recognition of our study and for selecting our abstract for this year, Henry Wagner Image of the Year Award. Tell me a little bit more about your image. First of all, I would like to thank all the cooperation partners and colleagues who contributed to this interdisciplinary project. Thank you. So our image describes the changes in cortical metabolism of post-COVID patients who were presented to our medical center to neurologists with persistent cognitive complaints. And as the pandemic proceeds, it becomes increasingly clear that these neurocognitive long-term consequences they occur not only in severe COVID cases. So deficits like impaired memory, disturbed concentration, and other cognitive problems, they may persist well beyond the acute phase of the disease. And therefore, in this study, we have examined these changes and we showed that this impairment of frontoparietal cognitive functions, they're related to frontoparietal cortical hypermetabolism, as was shown on FDG pad. And this was affected in about two thirds of subacute COVID-19 patients who were presented with at least two new neurological symptoms. 
So we prospectively examine the cause of this impairment and in part of the patients they will follow up until the chronic stage of the disease. And fortunately we saw that there was a significant improvement in the deficits uh, in cognition from one side and it was followed by almost complete normalization of brain metabolism. And as I said, it was approximately six months post-COVID. This project was interdisciplinary and as a prospective study and it was carried out by multiple departments of the Freiburg Medical Center. So it's my big pleasure to introduce you Dr. Jonas Hosp, who is the head of the post-COVID ambulance of the Department of Neurology and Clinical Neuroscience, with whom we have really closely cooperated on this project. My name is Jonas Hosp. I'm a neurologist attending physician in the University Hospital of Freiburg. I'm a neurologist. I see the patients and, uh, and the symptoms to understand why the patients has those symptoms, I need the colleagues uh, from the uh, imaginary uh, services uh, that help me to have a look uh, in the brains of the patients to see if there are any structural changes. And in the case of the nuclear medicine, to, to really see if the function is impaired and to give me really fine tools to see if there is something wrong within the brains you know, without those colleagues. Um, I couldn't do my work. So what do you think makes your image significant for nuclear medicine now and in the coming years? So we have employed FDG-PAD to study these post-COVID deficits in neuronal function and FDG-PAD is an established biomarker. Um, my marker of fun neuronal function as well as neuronal injury and it's widely available. So um, it made aids the diagnostic workup and follow-up in patients with persistent cognitive impairment after COVID-19. So we think the physicians that are treating this in patients, they should be aware of this phenomenon and they should include bedside tests evaluating cognitive function in their routine workup. So in consequence, I think this patient should be presented to neurologists and possibly allocated to cognitive rehabilitation programs. Our study is also an example of how a widely used technique can add value in the assessment of relatively new disorders and also patient management in time of pandemics. Tell me, what's next for your research? Um, it's first of all a big honor for me and it's a big pleasure for me to be part of this award and to be listed among uh, awarders. So I will continue to do my research. I'm currently at my postdoc position. So looking forward uh, to new great corporations and projects. That concludes day four and our coverage of the virtual meeting. It's been an absolute pleasure to bring you this year's cutting edge research and the latest in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. Remember, all of our content here in SNMMI TV will be available online after the meeting. So if you've missed anything, make sure to check it out. See you next year. I'm Dina Baer for SNMMI TV.